Okay, it is 7 o'clock and time to begin. If you want to take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Psalms, uh, the 73rd Psalm, to be more specific. And we will uh, read a lengthy section of that psalm uh, in just a few minutes. We welcome those watching online. Thankful that uh, so many can be here. During camp week, you're never quite sure what your numbers will be. You just know they're going to be down. So to have so many here is a very, very, very encouraging. Of course, now we have, we've got two or three high schoolers in here, former high schoolers. Anyway, in any event, we're glad to have all of you. Let's begin with a prayer. Holy Father, we are grateful for the gorgeous day that you've uh, given us. We're grateful uh, for the constant reminders of your goodness that we see and experience every day. Thankful that we can come together and receive encouragement and instruction, uh, and we pray your blessings on our class and uh, any other classes taking place at this time. In Jesus we pray, amen. What did you say, Mark? Psalm 73. Psalm 73. I want to begin with a statement that I found on Facebook. I don't know if you call this a, a meme, but a lot of times people will post a thought in a box. I haven't devoted myself to figuring out how people do that, but uh, here was the thought I found. Um, I think somebody probably found this and posted it. I want to get your thoughts on this. Worship gets you through the hardest times in your life because it shifts your focus from the problem to the problem solver. Capitalization on problem solver is my due. Because I, I, I think we understand exactly where this was pointing. Um, is there anything about that that maybe you're, I'm not sure if I quite agree Or agree. What, how does that statement strike you? Danny, let's start with well, you. I agree. Okay. And I agree because the problem is you said me. And we have got self with mm. that problem. I mean, when it says the hardest times in your life, that's kind of a broad statement, right? Um, so maybe sometimes reconciling that with the link with the word problem that's that's another kind of vague word I mean I, I would think that that a lot of us have experienced on some level the truth of this statement right I mean what's the general point of the statement okay what would we all agree that worship certainly can be helpful in getting us through the hardest times in our life. Would we say it's the only thing that gets us through the hardest times in our life? That, that, that could be where we're like, okay, that, that seems, you know, it's, it's a very strong statement. I just want you to think about that, Lauren. Right. Sometimes it can be really hard. Right. To do that. <clears throat> what do you like about this statement? Makes you do a check and balance in your <coughs> Kenny, did you have your hand up? I did. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I'm not going to answer that question. Okay. That's my. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You're fine. Um, I guess where I struggle with it, though, is it, that's more the byproduct. That's not. What's I don't, I don't worship. What's the byproduct? Sorry to interrupt. That it gets me through the hardest times. Oh, okay. I don't. My intent when I worship isn't, you know, it, my intent when I worship is to praise God for who He is. And I agree that in doing that, that shifts my focus to the problem solver and that 
and okay. I have no problem with that. I think it's just more that I don't worship to get through a problem. Yeah, it's not primarily a coping mechanism, but it has that sort of benefit associated with it. Is that, would that be a fair summary of, okay. Yeah. yeah, maybe we would say it like worship in, um, in its various forms. Well, not primarily as a you know, coping mechanism, certainly. They, it certainly can serve as a balm. I mean, another word, as I, and we've noted that's vague, is the word problem. I mean, some problems aren't like a leaking pipe. You can replace a leaking pipe, and it's done, right? unless I was doing it. <laughs> they might have to do it again. Um, but other problems like grief, well, you, you never escape that. That's going to that's be with you. So it can be a balm. Other thoughts? Phil? I guess I'm think, sitting here thinking, trying to think of a, of a passage that I would go to that states that. Mm. And I'm not sure I can, I'm not coming up with Right. I'm just not thinking. So right. That that creates a little bit of a problem where I'm telling myself and others what worship is, and I can't put scripture to it. Okay. So so maybe there's like okay, yeah. No, I'm kidding. I, I I think it, it it may be a byproduct, but it's not the point of worship. No, it's not. <clears throat> I would agree. But it's a thought provoking statement. That, that really what I want to do is, is springboard from that into a separate, really a question. What impact does worship have on us? And so I want, I want us to think, oh, and some hands are going up right away. I'm, I'm excited about that. So, so that's what I want to explore for the bulk of our time tonight we're covering lesson four in one session, and we're going to give that some treatment at the end. So um, some initial thoughts about that, and there'll be some things I want to get into. Danny, we'll go with Danny, Wyatt, and then Chris. How's that? Danny? Well, it makes me more Christ-like. Okay. By having proper worship. I agree with what our sister said. It's not the Sunday morning. Right. It's the everyday. Plugging into God. I think that question you had before should be what instead of worship. You mean on the on the statement yeah. here? It should say what gets you through the hard time. Oh, then put it in the form of a question. Right. Oh. So yeah. If you think that I can't talk for anybody else, for me the hardest time that's where fasting and prayer comes in. Sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> worship and all its yeah. Asking prayers, singing, yeah, other kinds of devotion. Why? Uh, definitely an impact when when I'm really properly worshiping and in tune. It, it most certainly draws me closer to God. Okay. I, uh, and also to kind of touch on what Mr. Danny said, like prayer as a form of worship during hard times. 
Ever been there where Wyatt's describing where you've been in a bad place, and let's say, for example, coming together with the saints, and then you're in at least a better place when you leave? Yet, yeah, how, how many of you have ever, I know what, how many of you have ever, okay, I'm not sure if I can make it tonight. I mean, whatever reason, not judging, or any, so it's just either emotionally or whatever, physically, and then you came together with the saints. You were kind of on the fence. And then afterward, it's like, oh, I'm so glad. How many of you have been there? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that, that's one, uh, one experience, I think. Um, not necessarily what you were speaking to, but it, it does for a time to at least take our minds off of. Even Again, that's not the primary purpose of worship is to help us cope with life. But, boy, it sure does help with life, doesn't it? Lauren? It does also oh. remind you that um, you have more at hand than you think you do as far as... Have more what than you More at hand as oh, okay. far as resources. You have your brethren for emotional support. Sure. For whatever you may be going through. If that's <coughs> an urgent to right. lay off what quiet was talking about. All right. All right. Chris, I'm sorry I skipped you, brother. That's okay. It centers us. It, it certainly does that. So, so that's what I want to explore tonight. Um, certainly worship can have an impact on us when we're in trials. We've talked about that. Um, and, and I'll just ask this. I think we've already started to answer this. But what other, in this vein, what other impact can or should worship have on us? And let me just pursue it to something you noted that there are different settings for worship. I've, I've heard it expressed this way. There is gathered worship, corporate worship, right? There is personal worship. These, these are words I've, I've found from someone else. Okay, I'm just offering them for what they're worth. There's family worship, right? And then in the vein of Romans 12, um, life worship or you know, the spiritual service, broadest sense of the term, uh, offering. So what other impact can or should worship have on us? So I don't want to limit you to a particular setting or type of worship, if you will. Uh, what, what other impact can or should worship have on us? And some of your comments have already pointed to some of that. Greater peace, strength. So maybe just speaking from your, your experience, what, or maybe not, just, just speaking based on your understanding of the scriptures. And if you have a passage that goes along with it, certainly that, would love to turn there and read that. We'll look at Psalm 73 in, in a moment. But. Any use thoughts of, about that? Go ahead. Uses of peace and Gives us a peace. Okay, sure. That sounds like Philippians four. Okay, Chris. So, so in worship, one of the impacts that has on us is to remind us, even if in a secondary way, that there are some things eternally that matter and some other things that probably don't. 
or just flat out dumb? So would it be fair to say that there is a perspective that worship can help us to have? Phil? Yeah. This, as mentioned earlier, what, what more intense location can there be to try to achieve that than right here amongst brethren gathered, doing the the, the worship as God is directed, edifying one another? I mean, it's where transformation, I I would think, yeah, has its greatest chance of occurring and change can occur more intensely. Right. One of the reasons why I think this is so important to talk about is you've heard that old adage, and I'm probably going to butcher this, that if you aim for nothing, that's exactly what you'll get. Do we enter into worship with purpose? And, and, and listen, to be, to be clear, the purpose is not what I get out of it. So I don't want to leave the wrong impression. But we are going into worship with purpose, and yes, we will come out of it with something. Greater connection, greater peace. Let's look at Psalm 73. I want to just read through this, and maybe the way we'll do this is I'll read a little bit, and then I'll ask a question something like, what's the struggle that the psalmist is having? So kind of read, discover, We'll, we'll share what that is in kind of a rapid fire because I, the, where I want to go with this is, is down several verses. But I think before we get to that point, there's a, there's, a, there's a picture here painted of the psalmist's life and the burdens of his heart that are, I think are all part of this. And I, and I thought of this passage when I saw this statement on Facebook that we talked about a, a few moments ago. Psalm 73 and verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel. To those who are pure in heart. Now that, that almost takes on the form of a summary statement. for, for that, That's where he's going to end up at. But then verse 2, there's a noticeable shift here. And, and then we get the very intense outpourings. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. What's the problem? What's the struggle, rather? What's his struggle? Seeing ungodly people doing better than he is. Seeing ungodly people prosper. There are doubts that he's uh, wrestling with. And then he expands on what he says in verse 3 about the wicked, for they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. Um, they are not in trouble as others are. It, I'll just stop and observe. Sometimes we, we, we make broad sweeping conclusions about a group of people by what we've observed in a few. <coughs> there certainly are wicked people that do prosper, but not all of them. Um, they are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Verse 6. Therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Can you imagine trying to paint this? Their hearts overflow with follies. Just notice the poetic language describing them here. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. Could you paint that? A tongue strutting? Almost, almost like a cartoonist might try to, to give us a, a rendering of that. So again, what's the struggle? The struggle is with the prosperity of the wicked. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? What's the struggle there? Specifically about the wicked. What are they doing? What's their attitude? Blasphemy? Yeah, God's he's not all powerful. They're just kind of uh, thumbing their nose at him, aren't they? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. Now notice verse 13. 
All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. What's the struggle? Personal sorrow? Persecution? Feels persecuted? Feels pointless to him? What's pointless? The fact that he is trying to live a better life than the wicked. Okay, so the scales here, he's kind of weighing this. They're getting away with everything. And, and so he's at the point where he's wondering is the life I'm living worth it? Ever been there? Yeah. I, I would say we have been. I mean, that's, that's, th those are real issues of the heart there. What about this? If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Now here we go, verses 16 and 17. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. So what's his state? In 16. He's trying to make sense of it all, and does he have hope of com coming with to some satisfactory resolution? He describes it as a wearisome task. He feels what what adjectives would we give to the guy at this point? Exhausted. Exhausted. Love it. Overwhelmed. Hopeless. Miserable, still trying, still trying, still wrestling, but he feels his strength running out. And then something changes in verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. What changed? And why? That's what we're left to ponder. It's not spelled out for us. I would think the hope of eternity and them not getting it, you're going to get it no matter what you go through. Okay. There's a, there's a hope of eternal reward for those who are faithful. Kenny? Almost the same thing, but slightly different. His perspective has now shifted, and he realizes that vengeance in the end is. I like how you said that. His perspective has shifted. Can worship accomplish that? I hope that it, it does. Because sometimes the fact is we come in here and we're just beat up. Not to put too fine a point on it. It ought to be. And Phil, I think your point was exactly right. There are blessings that should come. And, 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 and only... only by treating worship with its proper goal, you know, seeing it for what it, what it is, understanding what the real purpose of it is. But then secondarily, God blesses his people. So, so there is this path to worship, and we'll probably, you'll probably see that slide again tonight. There are blessings that come to us, and, and you think, well, how could coming into the presence of God, it, it should hardly be possible for us to come away unchanged or uh, unimpacted, I'm not sure that's a word, by that interaction with a holy God. And, and so for the psalmist here, and look, you can, I mean, encourage you to go on and study the rest of, of this psalm. Um, here is an example of how worship improves perspective. Uh, how can worship improve our attitude? How, let me ask you, let me get a little more specific. That's how, in what ways can worship, say, cultivate humility and gratitude as a couple of examples? Kenny? Well, I think the, the contrast in 16 verse 17, I think kind of helps answer that even. Because in 16, he's like, how I thought how I, mm. he was kind of the I, but in verse 17, it switches that he went into the sanctuary of God. That's, that's, a, that's a humbling, in a sense. And I think that kind of 
kind of <coughs> kind of gets to what you're going at is it's hard for me to praise the almighty power if I'm prideful of myself and what I think I can accomplish on my own. I have to be willing to humble myself to realize he who created me is greater and he has set a purpose for me. That's really well said. That it's it's not spelled out, but seventeen does imply there is a shift in, in, in what he's relying on. He's trying to figure it out, explain it, cope with it. And then 17, part of that perspective is, of course that's how I'll feel if it's just me. I mean, when he says, I discern therein, who's going to take care of the, of the wicked? It's not going to be him. If he, if he tries to be the one, that'll just be a, a, a futile endeavor. There's a, there's a holy God that sits on a throne. And, and it's, it's, it's like John in one of my favorite passages is Revelation 1. It's, there is no better image to give to those struggling seven churches than the picture of the glorified Christ in Revelation 1 or the pictures of the throne in Revelations 4 and 5. It's like, oh! What, what was an overwhelming crisis, now it's still, it's still a crisis but boy, there's a game-changing reality I've just been reminded of. And there's a holy God on the throne. I'm not saying that that, that, one, that that solves all our problems, but it does center us. You know, one of my pet peeves is when a brother or sister in Christ comes to you and wants help. And you say something, well, you know, we're studying that. Well, yeah, and without getting off into the subject of why people don't show up, there are a number of reasons why that could be the case, but certainly could be, you know, spiritual problems at, at the heart of that. Maybe not, maybe for some it is a case of not really understanding why we come together at all. And it goes well beyond the fact that the elders have have asked us to do that. Although, look, that's a very fine point to go to. Um, but there are even greater reasons um, that, that underlie that. Um, so Philippians 2 and verse 10 uh, talks about the fact that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And we see a similar statement in Revelation 1, right? Every eye will see him, all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. I've heard it said there will be no unbelievers, in some sense, on that final day. Sadly, it will be too late for some. But just the very presence of God. We think, you think of all the bad thinking in the world today. When the Lord appears, perspective. They worry about interest rates. <laughs> <laughs> there are vexing problems. And look, uh, that, that would be a good example of something that we're very concerned about. So for us, when we come into the presence of God, perspective doesn't make those problems go away. But Peace, perfect peace. Yeah. How does uh, oh, go ahead, Phil? I'm sorry. I was say, you know, in Hebrews 12. I just appreciate at the beginning. There's a simple recipe about faithfulness. He's built up to it. Yes. But it's this simple recipe, and at the crux of it is fix our eyes on Jesus, and that's what worship does. That's it. That's exactly uh, right. So he's reinforcing. Yeah. What he's taught to us, you know, he knows what we need to to, to stay faithful. We yeah. need to have that fixation, that perspective. We need to come together, you know, for for that. And uh, yeah. I think it's it's a reinforcement of a very simple, you know, something that he he's that he's trying to get across to us. 
come together to worship, he's reinforcing them what he's told us in Hebrews. Yeah. That's a really good expression, isn't it? I mean, you can take that, you can take that with you into every step literally you take during the day, right? As you as you sit on your bed and cry as another wave of grief hits you. Get through that and then look look to Jesus. Uh, I think elsewhere in Hebrews, well, and then maybe also in 2 Timothy. I'm thinking of 2 Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. That's one of that's the same kind of uh, mind cleansing, strength giving statements that we just we just need it every. There's not a time we don't need it. Appreciate you bringing that up. I, I think of Luke 22 and verse 40, 42. Have you gone away impacted from your praise? That's another. Verse. We, we kind of talked a lot about singing, but. Boy, there's a lot we could say about prayer. How did Jesus go away? I'll use the word changed, for lack of a better term, or impacted from his praying in Luke 22 and verse 42 at Gethsemane. What was the question again? It, how, if at all, was Jesus impacted by his praying at Gethsemane. He decided to turn it over to the Father instead of worrying about it. Okay. Kenny? He grounded himself to do God's will. Grounded himself, gave it over. Lauren? Strengthened. Strengthened. And I'm not. I think the resolve afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Do one of the accounts talk about an angel appearing, strengthening him? Yeah. No Gethsemane, no Golgotha. Do you agree with that? Yeah. He, he was weaker. He went, went to the Father in prayer. Yeah. I'm not trying to get into controversial statements at all, but but simply to emphasize the place that Gethsemane had in God's plan we sometimes maybe don't appreciate. But there, there certainly was a strength that Jesus received there that helped him to follow through. I mean, what, what does Jesus essentially do in that prayer? He commits himself. It's not that he hadn't before, but he certainly does more fully More completely, in the sense of, okay, now we're at it. And um, he's poured out his heart's desire. Nevertheless, not as I will. So I guess where I want to go with this is in our praying. Prayer is certainly an avenue for us to commit ourselves to the will of God. And so if we're not using the arm of prayer in that way, I would encourage us to do that. There is transformation that sometimes can o that only happens through that, that avenue of, of connection with God. And we see it here in the life of Jesus. And not just at Gethsemane, but in, in all of his praying, Jesus is a model to us. Prayer strengthens our commitment, plugs us into God. I thought about this, and, and then we'll have to move on. Even corporately, worship should have, and to circle back to your, your comment earlier, should worship, when we come together, should that have a unifying effect on the Nashua church? Sure. I mean, we think, well, why would it not? If we think of, I mean, how many of you have ever heard of, of the marriage triangle, right? We, right? There's the the man and the woman, and then there's God, and as the man and woman get closer to God, what do we say? Yes. They, they get, <laughs> as the man and woman get closer to God, they get closer to each other. Well, isn't the church married to Christ? So as each of us get closer to God, 
We're going to get closer to each other. We're going to get we're going to get closer to Christ. Okay, so really what lesson four was about, and as we go on into lesson five, was simply to remind us that we're thinking about the purpose of worship and things that can serve as obstacles to the flow of worship, to the path to worship. Um, it can be any number of things. It can be other people, it can be relationships, it can be time, focus, distractions. There's a great question on page 21, number three, that I would ask you to, to give thought to. Um, how, does it, how does it say it? I don't have it in front of me here. What is the most serious hindrance to your worship? It's important that we identify the correct, what the obstacle is versus what it isn't. <clears throat> so for instance, if we, if, we, if we have a heart issue but we think it's something else, we may end up treating the symptoms and not the cause. Let's say that I, I believe that the problem I'm having in my personal worship is environment. Or maybe we, we think we're having a problem with worship here and we think it's environment. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll just keep it to the individual. Maybe I think it's environment when the real problem is apathy, which, which he talks about. He talks about apathy-based worship killers in the heart and pride-based. I encourage you to read through those. You know, if I, if I, if I, if I make the wrong diagnosis about where the problem lies then I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pursue the, the right, right correction. And so maybe I, I change my environment somehow, uh, but it won't, I've not really addressed the issues of the heart. So there, there's a lot to be thought about, about the symptoms versus the cause. And whenever there are obstacles to worship in the heart, certainly, uh, we need to act. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, notice that the apostle says, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If I can go back to our previous slide, there certainly could be a worship application here, right? So what Peter is speaking about is, is treating issues of the heart. And in fact, until that is treated, what will not flow freely into the heart, according to verse 2? <coughs> yeah. And until we've done that work, maybe in parable of the sower terms, until we've excavated some rocks and thorns and whatever, there's not going to be a free-flowing, there's not going to be a longing for, much less a free-flowing of the pure spiritual milk of God's word into our hearts. And so would that have an impact on worship? Most certainly. So that's the, the kind of introspection that God causes us to have. Worship should uh, indeed uh, primarily give praise and glory to God, but certainly should be edifying, encouraging, strengthening for each, each one, each worshiper. You know, earlier when you just talked about the man who wanted to get closer to God, what that's talking about is unity, fellowship, and communion. <laughs> First John 1, fellowship with God, fellowship with one another. You have to have one to have the other. Yeah. Any other thoughts? And that's, that's basically, those are the points I wanted to convey tonight. Well, there we go. So, for Sunday, uh, John's going to lead us through... Uh, a study of Lesson 5, Sunday and Wednesday. I've noticed that we're, um, 
our supply of books is gone, so I'll see about getting some more of those, or at least have copies of Lesson 5 ready uh, if extra copies are needed. Thank you all. Good evening. We're going to have a couple of songs this evening, and then Brother Junior is going to give us a talk. Um, in James, the fourth chapter, in verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You are my strength. No me.
number 104 in the hymns for worship. Number one, um, sorry, number 105. I am thine, O Lord. No me. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and did told thy love to When the elders were starting, were talking about uh, adding a devotion on Wednesday night, we wrote down around several things what we might do, and some of us, you know, re if you seen something that brought your interest, well, you presented on, you know, or if you had a special prayer or special special praise or something like that, uh, we could share that on Wednesday night. So. I'm going to do a little something a little different tonight. My thoughts are going to be somebody else's thoughts. And so Chris is going to show us a, a, a clip that was put on Facebook by uh, Darlena Meyer, and it's presented by Don Truex. Now, many of you may have already seen it, but I think it's good enough that we can say that it's uh, we can get something out of it by looking at it again. A matter of fact, this, if after tonight, this will be six times that I've looked at it. So 
I really like it, and so I hope you do too. And so we're going to let Chris present that. I heard a song this week for the first time in a long time. It was released over a decade ago by Kenny Chesney, simply entitled, Don't Blink. The premise of the song was of a younger man who was hearing a 102-year-old man being interviewed on the evening news. And the reporter, of course, asked the obligatory question, what's the secret to life? To which the centenarian replied, don't blink. The lyrics of the song came from that very simple sentiment. And the lyrics simply said this, don't blink. Just like that, you're six years old and you take a nap and you wake up and you're 25 and your high school sweetheart becomes your wife. Don't blink. You just might miss your babies growing like mine did, turning into moms and dads. Next thing you know, your better half of 50 years is there in bed and you're praying that God takes you instead. Trust me, Fred, a hundred years goes faster than you think. So don't blink. You know, it's hard to hear those words without being reminded of the words of an inspired writer who reminded us that our lives really are just a morning fog that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And so, could I encourage you to do three things today? Number one, make the most of every day, this day, because this could be your last day. So, make a difference, do your best, mark your life with excellence. Secondly, don't put things off. You can stuff today into tomorrow, but eventually you may not have the health or the mind or inevitably the life to do so. And so do you need to tell someone you love them? Tell them today. Do you need to forgive someone? Forgive them today. Do you need to be reconciled with someone? Be reconciled today. Remember, one day there won't be a next day. And then third, build a close relationship with the Lord. Pray often, read his word, shine your light, build a character, teach your kids about God. Walk close to him now so that you can walk with him forever. Because my friends, time, time is undefeated. One day you and I will breathe our last. So don't blink, just a thought. As I viewed this, up in the morning, brought my tea before I see my queen. Wow. As I viewed this and thought about what he said and how time, how time passes so fast, how that it's over before you really know it. As we look back on our lives and see our children grow in our and they get married, and then they have grandchildren, and then grandchildren go to college, and then the grandchildren are married and, and have kids, and so uh, it's just a, a, a reality point for all of us. And I think especially for us that are on the upper ages, <laughs> they, uh, that is a re reality uh, check uh, for us. Uh, because our, our days are numbered and, and, uh, and we're, some of us, that's what I'm talking about me, uh, we're getting closer to knocking on the doors of eternity every day. And so I hope this was something that you enjoyed as much as I have. And we're going to turn it over to Phil because he had some closing thoughts. Lauren Thompson has asked us to keep her in her... In our prayers, she's meeting with her surgeon on August 9th to discuss uh, an impending heart catheterization that has been set uh, as of now for September 19th, and I think you're going to be talking about that, that procedure. So we'll continue to, to keep you in our thoughts and prayers, um, knowing that you've been struggling um, with, your, with your health. So remember her. Also remember all those that will be traveling as, um, as camp breaks up. They, I saw... Luke posted a picture, and I, I, I don't think I've ever seen that many Nashua folks down at camp. I mean, it's, it's an all-time record 
And so it's, it's a really great thing that they have that opportunity, but let's pray for their safety coming home. Um, that's all I know to announce, if you'll bow with me. Father, bless us as we leave here. We thank you for all that you are and all that you do and mean for us. We pray for perspective, and we thank you for um, knowing and, 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 and being in control of everything, and we know that everything is in your time. Would you help us, Father, to, to live our lives, live the rest of this week with the proper perspective? Through your Son, we pray. Amen.